Seattle, Washington. The skyline you see today is a picture of a young city. The history of Seattle is a brief one, beginning in 1852, almost two and one half centuries after the pilgrims came to America. When you look at Seattle's skyline in the coming century, the city by Elliott Bay will still be young as major cities determine their age. Seattle has had many nicknames. Someone once wrote in stone, Seattle, portal of the North Pacific. Seattle was once called the hydroplane capital of the world. Jet City, Queen City, City of Seven Hills. Seattle is a city which every now and then thrusts ever higher toward the sky. It is a city of spirit, one determined to grow. But there was a time when a building called the Smith Tower was the outstanding landmark in her skyline. And there was a time when there was hardly any skyline at all. In 1879, the city covered an area from Lake Union on the north to Beacon Hill on the south. This relief map was taken from an old government survey. It shows the hills and gullies of old Seattle. The town site of Seattle was filed with the government land office on May 23, 1853, the legal birthday of Seattle. On the south, at the location of the Stetson Post Mill, is the present location of the King County Dome Stadium. All of this area to the south was once water and tide flats. As Seattle began to grow, the problem of streets became increasingly important. Some streets were built by private groups, but these were little more than rough trails hacked out of the forest. But public transportation was increasing, so the city council set up on a program to construct better streets. The first surfacing was wood planks, and for several years, wood planking was used for both sidewalks and streets. But the planks became worn and loose. Sometimes during the winter months, the planks would be covered with mud, and soon wood planking became less desirable. The Great Fire in 1889 disrupted all city improvements. The blaze started at First Avenue and Madison Street when a boiling glue pot in a cabinet shop overturned. The fire spread rapidly and was never really brought under control. It burned itself out in the tide flats to the south. Within seven hours, over 30 blocks of the business district were in ruins. The waterfront and everything south of University Street was completely burned. Wharves, banks, hotels, and business establishments were in ruins. First Avenue and Madison Street and on down First Avenue to Columbia, to Cherry, the Boston Block on Second Avenue, the Northwest Cracker Factory at First and University. The King Street area was gone, and Yester's Mill and Wharf. It was not the fire that made history, but rather Seattle's reaction to it. In less than a week, the people had recovered from the shock and were laboring with renewed enthusiasm. The rapidity with which the city rebuilt itself sent Seattle's fame throughout the nation. Nothing like it had ever been witnessed on the American continent with the single exception of the Chicago fire in 1871. Within four years, over 130 new buildings had been built of brick, stone, and steel. Some buildings ranged up to eight stories high. Better streets were constructed of brick, granite blocks, and gravel. There were even some streets paved with wood blocks. In 1897, when the good news of the discovery of gold in the Klondike came down from the north, the vast trade with Alaska, which was to grow with these discoveries, the construction of railroads and establishment of steamship lines 
became the most important factor in the growth and prosperity of Seattle. Fishing and lumbering industries also attracted thousands of people to Seattle. Through the years, the lumbering industry and the manufacture of forest products in western Washington made itself known and felt throughout the world. By 1900, Seattle had grown to over 80,000 people. That was the year the first automobile arrived in Seattle. It was electric. Little did the people of those days realize the tremendous impact the horseless carriage would have many years later. Business began to move north of Pioneer Square. Many new office buildings lined 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Avenue. North of Lake Union, the city was taking shape in the residential districts. Streetcar service had been extended to the Fremont district. One outstanding civic project in Seattle's history was the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. In 1906, Seattle businessmen incorporated to finance and promote the fair. And in June of the next year, 20,000 people turned out for the groundbreaking ceremonies on the new campus of the University of Washington. Two years later, on June 1st, 1909, the fair was officially opened. Opening day was declared a legal holiday, and there was a spectacular military parade down 2nd Avenue. The Seattle police drill team was there, the mayor and dignitaries of the exposition. Out at the fairgrounds, David Wagoner's concert band picked up the momentum. And James J. Hill, the empire builder, who as president of the Great Northern Railroad had built the line west to Seattle only 16 years earlier, gave the opening address. The main entrance to the fair was located at what is now the main entrance to the University of Washington campus. The Court of Honor and Federal buildings overlooked Geyser Basin. From here, one could look south over a beautiful waterfall called the Cascades toward a full view of Mount Rainier. The Court of Honor was the focal point of the exposition, and here spectators paraded in their best Sunday attire. Directly east of the Court of Honor was Nome Circle and the Forestry Building with its spectacular columns of Douglas fir from Snohomish County. There were documentary displays of American history, and twice a day, a simulated battle of Gettysburg from America's Civil War was staged. The Midway was called the Pay Streak, and on opening day, over 80,000 people were there. It was a virtual Disneyland of fun and excitement. There was Prince Albert, the educated horse.
there were pony rides for the kiddies. There was a rodeo and Dixieland jazz. And there was a thrill ride called the Tickler. Twenty-five countries sent exhibits to the fair. From all over the world came statuary and paintings. The exposition demonstrated that this was the age of electricity. Electric lights of many colors trimmed all the buildings. On that final day in October, all the lights of the exposition were darkened. The remaining crowd sang all Lang Syne under the starry sky, then left quietly in the darkness. In 1910, Seattle entered a new era called the regrading years, which was a series of public works construction projects to cut down the steep hills and to establish better streets and to allow more buildings to be constructed. The Jackson Street and Dearborn Street regrades provided access to the Rainier Valley. Five million cubic yards of earth were sluiced into the tide flats just south of King Street creating new landfills for commercial expansion. Further north in the Central Business District, 3rd Avenue and 4th Avenue were regraded from the site of the King County Courthouse to the Olympic Hotel. Some streets were lowered over 20 feet. During the regrading years between 1898 and 1930, over 60 regrades were accomplished. The removal of Denny Hill was the largest regrade of all. It provided better access to the north end of the city, and many new streets were graded and paved. At the south end of the city, dredging of the tide flats and enlarging Seattle's harbor facilities provided material to build Harbor Island in 1910. Further development during the years moved the Duwamish River to the west side and provided more material to enlarge the Georgetown area and to build Boeing Field. With the building of Harbor Island, trestles gave way to streets and bridges. At Spokane Street in 1917, a low-level swing bridge was constructed over the West Waterway. In 1924, it was replaced with a higher bridge. A second bridge was built in 1928, and Spokane Street was regraded, widened, and paved. In 